Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Turn your King James Bible to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. You know, when I read this stuff, it's hard for me to even fathom that uh, any saved people would even dare to believe that Paul was a false apostle. Now, I hear people say that. I, I know they're of the devil, and I hope you are too. Listen to this. Uh, now, remember, the Ephesians were citizens of Ephesus, which was a city-state in Greece. Okay? So, Paul's writing this to the Greeks. Verse 1, Ephesians 2, 1. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God." not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Uh, my note here. You see, with salvation comes good works. Good works are proof of salvation. You know, what is the proof that an apple tree is an apple tree? Well, when it produces apples, then that's the proof that it's an apple tree. If you got an apple tree and it doesn't produce any apples, what good is it? Cut it down, plant something else, right? Verse 11, wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Read uh, Jeremiah 3 and verse 8. God divorced Israel, but not Judah. That's why they were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But in Jeremiah 31, 31, God says he would make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. New covenant, not a renewed covenant. When you hear the you-know-who's talking about a renewed covenant, well, let them have their little temple and let them have their little animal sacrifices and they can do their little renewed covenant. And uh, let them see where it gets them. Just remember, the Romans came 
when God gave the you know who's a message in 70 AD when they destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. And God gave them another message in 363 AD when they tried to redo the temple and fire came down, uh, fire came out of the ground and killed the workers. And then there was an earthquake or a series of earthquakes. I'm not sure, but there was at least one earthquake. God said, nope, you ain't going to build a temple. Jesus said, it is finished. So, uh, Ephesians 2.12 ties in with Jeremiah 3.8 and Jeremiah 31.31. 31. Read it. I did in a previous study, so. Verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes were afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of the partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. You know, there was 600 and something laws and ordinances and judgments and statutes. Um, you know, it wasn't possible to keep them all. You broke one, you were guilty, period. It's so much easier to just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But, you know, the Hebrew Roots people, they'd rather have that renewed covenant and go back to animal sacrifices and worship their coming Messiah. Yeah, their Messiah is coming. And they'll probably call him Yeshua. Verse 16, And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And what do you mean both? Well, both the house of, house of Israel and the house of Judah. Verse 17, And came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord." In whom all the building fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom also, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. All right, let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 3. Now, remember something. Uh, Jesus is called the last Adam. Now, who was the first Adam? Well, Adam, right? Adam and Eve. Adam. Who was Adam's mother? Eh, if you wanted to say Mother Earth, eh, you could, I guess, because God took, you know, the, the dust of the earth and then breathed into him the breath of life and he became a living soul. So... I don't know. I think that's kind of a stretch saying Mother Earth. But but who is his father? In, I think it's the book of Matthew or Luke in chapter 1, it even says that Adam was a son of God. Jesus is called the only begotten son of God. So Adam had the same father and mother that Jesus did. 
And no, I don't think Mary's DNA was used. Reason being was it says um, that uh, sin fell upon all uh, flesh. Let me let me pull that up real quick. All right, that's in Romans five and verse twelve. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So, death, uh, when Adam and Eve sinned, it uh, death by sin passed upon all men and women. But the point is, uh, the Bible even clearly says that, uh, let me take a look. In Hebrews 4.15, and we'll cover this again. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Uh, Christ, the reason Christ is called the last Adam is he had the same mother and father as the first Adam. Yes, I know Mary carried him in the, her womb, but he had the same mother and father as the first Adam. In 1 Corinthians 15, 45, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Now, why would Jesus be called the last Adam? Well, because he had the same mother and father as the first Adam. But yes, Mary did carry him in her womb, but I don't believe, my opinion is, I don't believe that her DNA was used. Otherwise, he would have corrupted sin nature like, you know, Mary did like all of us did. But the, my point is, uh, Mary was the cousin of Elizabeth, who was the mother of John the Baptist. And uh, her husband was Zacharias. They were Levites, the tribe of Levi. Mary was of the tribe of Levi. Uh, the Levite priesthood, a, a, a woman of the a Levite priesthood, carried Christ in her womb. You know, they were the ones that were working the tabernacle. But what was Joseph? Joseph was of the tribe of Judah, which was the king tribe. So you had basically a merging of the king tribe with the priest tribe. Huh. All right, so let's go to Hebrews chapter 3. Verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Now think about this. When John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Christ was considered the sinless Lamb, the sinless, spotless Lamb, who died on Passover. He was our Passover Lamb. I mean, you know, so you had a merging of the king and the priesthood. And he's our high priest who's able to go into the tabernacle and offer his own blood on the mercy seat. Christ is actually going to be sitting on the mercy seat showing mercy to those that are in Christ. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, 
Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, insomuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. Now remember in John chapter 1, uh, you know, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it, it declares that all things were made by him, or created by him. I'm kind of paraphrasing, but read John 1. Christ was a God that created all things. And people, you know, people, uh, they can't wrap their heads around that. You know, the thing is, the Bible plainly teaches that man was made in God's image. And man has a body, man has a soul, and man has a spirit. God made man in his image. Body, soul, and spirit. Of course, this were the corrupted version, the sin version, but uh, they can't wrap their heads around, you know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They can't wrap their heads around this, most people. You know, you're, you're a, a tripart being. And God made us in our, his image. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16, look it up. I mean, he created all things. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his house, over his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Yeah, we got to be faithful to the end. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. You know, verse 14, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, when they had heard, they uh, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Chapter 4. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, 
any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which had have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Huh. You know, Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. You know, before we even were born and fell into sin, before Adam was even made, Christ was already ordained to die for our sins. Verse 4. For he spoke in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached, enter not in because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest, to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Um, Bob's note here. Uh, perhaps you've heard of the millennial reign of Christ. The word millennium uh, comes from the Latin word. It means, uh, well, you've heard of a millimeter a thousandth of a meter. Milli, it means thousand. Millipede, you know. Uh, I've heard people say, oh, well, you know, Latin words don't belong in English. Well, you know, like Lucifer. Did you know that about 20% of English comes from Latin words? Really, it does. You ever heard the word ultra? Corpse, yeah, Latin words, people. Uh, I could give you a, a, a whole list of Latin words if I, you know, thought about it. But a lot of a lot of English words come from Latin. A lot of English words come from Greek. I mean, uh, Latin words. I mean, uh, look in a law dictionary. It's full of Latin words. Just full of Latin words. Unbelievable. I guess we shouldn't use the word taco because it's Spanish, right? Call it something else. But uh, the point is, I believe the earth is about 6,000 years old. And I believe the millennial reign of Christ, when he returns, there's a thousand years of rest. I think that's going to be basically the Sabbath day. To the Lord. There's a verse in 2 Peter, it says, uh, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as a day. Well, at the end of the sixth day comes the seventh day of the Lord, anyways. And there'll be a thousand years when Satan will be bound, and that'll just be the introduction to eternity, where time won't be counted anymore but that's kind of what I think they're talking about here when they talking about um, entering into rest so I don't know verse 11 let us labor therefore to enter into that rest lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. You know, a two-edged sword cuts both ways. Yeah. 
Think about that. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. See, the Bible tells you that soul and spirit, they're not the same thing. You're a body with a soul and a spirit. Three parts. One person. And then there's people like the Jehovah's Witnesses will say, oh, the Trinity is a false doctrine. Well, I don't like the word Trinity. I don't like it because it's not in the Bible. Of course, the word Bible is not in the Bible either. Scriptures is. Uh, but Trinity, instead of using Trinity, I like to use the word Godhead. And that's in 1 Timothy 3.16. Godhead. Jesus Christ is part of the Godhead. He was God made flesh. Emmanuel. I think it's Isaiah 7.14, if memory serves me correctly. And uh, in Matthew chapter 1. Emmanuel, God with us. That's what it means. God with us. And I wish those that used Yeshua would use Emmanuel. I would be, yeah, I totally agree. You want to call him Emmanuel, that's fine. That's one of his names or titles, God with us. But Yeshua is nowhere in the New, the New Testament. And, you know, Joshua is um, the sixth book of the Bible. <laughs> he was the one that took over for Moses. Yeah. So... If you want to use a, a, a name that's in both Old and New Testament, call him Emmanuel, if you don't like Jesus. The name, anyways. I hope you love Jesus. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And no, we ain't talking about soul music or soul food. No. Piercing even even to the dividing sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to deal, uh, to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. See, you know why that veil, when Christ died on the cross, the veil of the temple ripped from the top to the bottom. And one place you can record a uh, this is recorded is in Matthew chapter 27, verse 49. I'm sorry, verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Now, this is the crucifixion. Verse 51. And behold, the veil of the temple, the veil of the temple, the holy of holies, where the high priest would go in once a year, okay, the high priest would go in once a year and offer blood on the mercy seat and the Ark of the, uh, the, Ark of the Covenant. Okay? And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to heaven to the bottom to the earth. Ah. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Oh, yeah. The veil of the temple for the high priest from heaven to the earth. Think about that. Back to Hebrews 4.15. For we have not an high priest. Oh, I'm sorry. Verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, 
but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. See, if Christ had sinned, he wouldn't have been the Lamb of God that we needed. Verse 16, listen to this. Let us therefore come boldly, come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. See, Jesus is our high priest who goes into the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant. He's the one that gave Moses the Ten Commandments. He's the one that made the rod of Aaron uh, bud. He was the one that gave us manna from heaven, and he is the bread from heaven. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and listen to this series again. Think about it. I, I, I know when I do a series and it's like a week apart from the beginning to the end, you forget some stuff. And I probably do too. But, uh, you know, Christ is going to be sitting on that mercy seat showing mercy to those who, who believe, trust, and love him. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. That throne of grace, I think that's the mercy seat. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. All right, let's go read chapter 5, Hebrews 5, verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Now, remember something, people. The book of Leviticus was for the Levitical priesthood, the tribe of Levi, who were called of God, for service of the tabernacle and later the temple. The book of Hebrews is basically the Christian book of Leviticus. If you ever study the book of Leviticus, you should definitely study the book of Hebrews afterwards. Because Christ fulfilled all that stuff in the book of Leviticus. Fulfilled it all. Somebody send the Jews a memo. Verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. You see, you, uh, you couldn't take that honor to, to serve God the tabernacle. No, you had to be called, like Aaron was. Verse 5, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he said also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, Melchizedek's an interesting study. He was the king of Salem, and Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, the king of Salem. Uh, the Jews say shalom. It means peace. And uh, you know what Salem is called today? 
It's called Jerusalem. Yeah. So, I guess it's City of Peace. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. But Chaplain Bob, it be, if we obey him, that that's that's lordship salvation. That's a heresy. Yeah, that's what they tell you. If you obey the Lord because you love him, that, they call that lordship salvation. Oh, you're trying to earn your salvation by being obedient. Well, go be a hitman for the mafia, you know. If you think you can do that and be saved, go for it. You know, I just, I don't understand these people. Well, yeah, I do. Some of them are actually misled and others are just probably devil-possessed children of the devil. I don't know. So Jesus, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you're dull of hearing. Better get a hearing aid, people. For when... For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of unrighteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to, to discern both good and evil. That's right. I would love to feed people meat, but uh, most can't bear it. I could do some really heavy-duty Bible stuff, but uh, most people can't uh, handle it. So... But you know what? Uh, my thing is to warn you people about the Noahide laws, the coming of the beast, the mark of the beast, uh, love the Lord, love thy neighbor, obedience. You know, the things that will get you in, help, you know, help you get into the kingdom. That's what I try to specialize in. And... I hope I'm I hope I'm doing a job that's worthy of the Lord. All right, let's get keep going here. All right, let's take a look at verse uh uh Hebrews chapter 6 verse 20. Uh let's see. Now, verse 19. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us, entered even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Chapter 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, you see, in Melchizedek, you had the king and you had the priest. One off, uh, two offices and one person. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Now remember um, the story. I'm, uh, Lot was 
taken captive by somebody, I don't remember who, uh, and then Abraham took his armed, his servants, his trained armed servants, and went after them and slaughtered those that had kidnapped Lot and brought them back. And of course, Abraham uh, grabbed all the all their stuff, all the gold and silver that these guys had stolen from everybody else. So what did he do? Abraham, when he met Melchizedek, gave him a tithe, a tenth of everything that he had gotten from these people. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. That's what a tithe means. It means a tenth. First, being by interpretation king of righteousness. Isn't that the office of Christ, the king of righteousness? And after that also, king of Salem, which is king of peace. So if you didn't know what Salem meant, king of Salem, which is king of peace. You know, the Bible, the King James Bible interprets the Bible. When I have people tell me, oh, you're one of those King James only people, you know what? Go read your NIV, where Jesus in Revelation 22 is the morning star, and then go to Isaiah 14, where the morning star fell from heaven and is going down to the pit of hell to be covered with worms. Yeah, the NIV deletes the word Lucifer and inserts Morning Star, a name of Jesus, effectively making Jesus Lucifer. And the complete Messianic, the complete Jewish Bible, a Messianic Jew, David Stern, does the same exact thing. And people fall all over for that Bible. Oh, it. It uses his Hebrew names, Yeshua. Ugh. You know what? Let them, let them, let them use those Bibles. Let them, exp let them explain to Christ why it's proper to use a name of Christ for the guy that fell from heaven going to the pit of hell to be covered with worms, to be destroyed. Let them. I don't even care. Matter of fact, I had a a girl that even lied on well, supposedly a girl, had a girl's name on uh, the face fake book uh, the Bible study group that I'm helping administrate. Uh, she was bragging about her complete Jewish Bible. And uh she even lied about what Isaiah 14 said. She says, oh, that's Lucifer. No, your Bible doesn't say Lucifer. It says Morning Star. You know, when, when, uh, when they lie, I, I, I kicked her out of the group. You know, when they know what they're doing. You know, it isn't through ignorance. They know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. They're evil. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, being first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Verse 3. Now, they're contrasting Jesus with Melchizedek. Now, whether Melchizedek was Christ... In his pre-human form, I leave that up to you to decide. Some people say yes, some people say no. I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me either way. But listen to verse 3. Now they're talking about Melchizedek here. Being by interpretation king of righteousness and also, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Verse 3. Without father, without mother, 
did Christ have a father, a, a human father? No. Did he have a human mother? No. I don't think so. Mary carried him in her womb, but was Mary the mother of God? Uh, only if you're a Catholic, I guess. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days, why wouldn't Christ have a beginning of days? Because he was God, come in the flesh. Having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. See, Hebrews is a wonderful book. Um, and Hebrews doesn't tell you who was the author of this book. Now, personally, I think Paul wrote this book. Paul was very learned. He was a he was he was a trained he was trained as a rabbi, which well, rabbi means master, but he was trained to be a Pharisee by Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a very learned, very famous uh, doctor of the law. Matter of fact, I've read some of his book uh, work in the Talmud. Yeah. Yeah, I've read portions of the Talmud. I've read some of Gamaliel's work. I don't know if that man ever got saved, but I I tell you what, he had some he had some interesting he knew a lot. He knew a lot. I, I can't remember. It's been probably over twenty five years since I've read his work, but uh I can't remember any of it. But I, I was impressed by what I read. So Verse 4, now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. Huh. So without father, without mother, not having any descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of his spoils. For verily they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. Hmm. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. Next time you hear a, a preacher say you got to pay tithes, the tithes were only for the tribe of Levi. Tell him, prove to me you're a Levitical priest, show me your genealogical records going back to Levi. And I'll pay you. A t I'll pay you a tithe. And if they can't do it, they're liars. Because only the Levites were to pay the tithe, and they are liars. Verse seven. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here, men that die receive tithes. But there he receiveth them of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. And as I may so say, Levi also, who received tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. Do you understand that? See, Levi wasn't even born yet, but yet he paid a tithe via Abraham to this Melchizedek. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the twelve tribes, which includes the tribe of Levi and the tribe of Judah. So Abraham was the great-grandfather. Yeah, great-grandfather of Levi. So Levi paid tithes through Abraham, his great-grandfather, to Melchizedek. 
I hope that makes sense. Sometimes I do these studies in the middle of the night and I'm tired and I know what I'm trying to get across and what I'm trying to say, but, you know. All right. And as I may say so, Levi also who received tithes paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Ah, oh, there was a change also of the law. You ever heard people say, Oh, I don't believe in Paul because Paul changed the law. Uh, no, Christ changed the law. Remember the two commandments? You know, Christ said, love the Lord, love thy neighbor. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And if they don't like Paul, they don't like Christ who sent Paul. And if you don't like Christ, you don't like God the Father that sent his only begotten Son. I mean, it's just the way it works. Don't argue with me. Argue with the Lord when you meet him. So, verse 12. For the priesthood being changed, there is of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. And what's the better hope? Jeremiah 31, 31, the new covenant. And the Jews want a renew covenant, a renew. They want to redo the thing that didn't work in the first place. Well, if you want to redo what didn't work in the first place, you have at it, buddy boy. I pass. You could have your little Noahide laws that exist only in the minds of a rabid ribeye steak. You know, a rib eye. Yeah. No gracias, senor. I don't want it. Now, if you want to read about Melchizedek, you can read in um, Genesis chapter 14. Um, I'm just going to skip to uh, verse 17. Or verse 18. Uh, Genesis 14 and 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. Wow. Jesus is called the bread of life, right? What, what was at the Last Supper? Bread and wine. Right? 
And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Wow. All right, so let's go back to uh, Hebrews chapter 7. Um, 17. Hebrews 7, 17. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did by the way which we draw nigh unto God. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. Better, a better testament. You know, the New Testament is better than the Old Testament, which the Hebrew roots want to do a renew, renew the old, which is worse. Anything to get away from Jesus. You know, they'll do anything they can. Yeah, Hebrew roots, rotten fruits. What can I tell you? By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testimony, testament. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Wow. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. You know what an intercessor is? Well, you probably heard this before. God the Father is the judge. You're on trial. And Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, is your defense lawyer. And Satan's the prosecuting attorney. How can you lose? Verse 26. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, blameless, undefiled, separate, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once, for this he did once, when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law, maketh the Son, who is consecrated forevermore. Chapter 8. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the, this is the sum. You know, that's a, a, a mathematics term. Uh, what's the sum of the problem? Um, let me look that up. I had to look it up. It had been a long time since I'd taken math in college. The sum is the result of adding two or more numbers uh, the product of two or more numbers is the result of multiplying the numbers. So the sum is adding. I had to look that up. I knew it was a mathematical term but I couldn't remember. 
Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens. Yeah, he sits on the right hand of God the Father. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle. Isn't that what we've been studying? Yeah. Which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the examples and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for see saith he that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount see the book of leviticus told you exactly how to make the tabernacle it was very detailed verse 6 but now hath he abhorred or de, oh, i'm sorry but now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. But Chaplain Bob, ah, the Hebrew roots people, they got a renewed covenant. Well, they got a worse covenant. Because if the new covenant's a better covenant, they got a worse covenant. Why in the world would you want to listen to uh, 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 people that are known for rejecting Christ and want to renew a worst a worse covenant. I mean that sounds like stupidity. Verse six, chapter eight, verse six. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. Verse 7, listen to this. None of the Hebrew Roots people will read this because it shows that they're in error. Well, not just error, it's a heresy. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. In the Bob translation, if the first was if the first was perfect, there'd have been no need to replace it. You know, if the if it had worked the first time, there'd have been no reason to go to the the next, you know, the new covenant. If the old covenant would have worked, you don't need the new covenant, right? Verse eight. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Hold your place. I want you to go to Jeremiah 31, 31. Because that's exactly what we're quoting here. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a renewed covenant? No. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new, N-E-W, new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Back to Hebrews 8.8. 8. The number 8 signifies a new beginning. Hebrews 8.8, 8 is that's wonderful. 8 is a new beginning. Think about it. How many days in a week? 7. Work 6 days, 7th day you rest. 8th day is the first day of the new week. Hebrews 8.8, 8. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that 
uh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Well, guess what that's quoting? Jeremiah 31, verse 33. Now, uh, now, I just read Jeremiah 31, 31. Now we're going to read Jeremiah 31, 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. You notice this is called the book of Hebrews, not the book of Jews. No, it's the book of Hebrews. Chapter 8, verse 9. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Wow. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith, a new covenant he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Wow. When it comes to our sins, God's going to hit the delete button. Oh, wipe that memory. It's gone. All right, well, let's read chapter 9. Boy, there is so much good information here. Uh, verse 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. That was the holy of holies, people. Verse 4, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant, and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. In other words, the Ten Commandments. And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. When, now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went all ways into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest, listen to this, but into the second, okay, the Holy of Holies, but into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not 
make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. See, the, the gifts and sacrifices and the blood that he was offering, it wasn't a perfect service. Verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and cardinal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. But by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us, for if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Oh, man, we got to go run to those Hebrew Roots people and, and go do that renewed covenant. You know, they're spitting on Christ when they talk that stuff. You think about it. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause... He is the mediator of the new covenant that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testimony, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament, a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Uh, do you know what the difference between a covenant and a testament is? A covenant is sort of like an agreement or a contract. Uh, but a testament, have you ever heard of a last will and testament? Yeah, a testament is does not go into effect until the testator, the person that makes it, dies. So, Verse 16, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator, and that's Christ. For a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament, uh, testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. And without shedding of blood is no remission. It is therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once... In the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. 
And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. This one verse kills the doctrine or the belief in reincarnation. And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. All right, I think that's it for now. Um, I will probably do one last study on this where I'll cover Hebrews 11, maybe 12, and maybe 13, and that'll close out the chapter. But um, I hope that uh, the book of Hebrews pretty much wraps up everything contained in the Old Testament and the covenants and the tabernacle. So all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is Christ, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.